Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin with day seven of the war in Ukraine. Right now, Russian troops are gradually getting closer to the capital of Kyiv. Blasts and air raid sirens were heard across several major cities overnight. The Ukrainian military says Russians are trying to advance in all directions. This morning also closing in on the southern city of Kursan, where this apartment building was hit by Russian shelling. Right now, Ukraine says it still controls the city, with the mayor there saying, quote, we are all waiting for a miracle right now. As Russia intensifies attacks, Ukraine's president is telling Putin to stop the bombing and sit down at the negotiation table. And last night, President Biden spent part of his first State of the Union address talking about the invasion of Ukraine, announcing he's closing U.S. airspace to the Russians, further isolating Putin. Russia's Vladimir Putin sought to shake the very foundations of the free world, thinking he could make it bend to his menacing ways. But he badly miscalculated. We begin our coverage this hour with NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel, who filed this report from Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. This is the television tower here in Kiev that Russia targeted next to a Holocaust memorial. And it seems that Russian forces missed their main target because the tower is still standing. It is still working as Ukrainian resistance and Russian logistical problems are slowing down Vladimir Putin's assault. Firefighters overnight battled what could be the flames of President Putin's frustration. After fresh Russian attacks overnight, Russia has intensified its air and missile assaults as Russian forces lay siege to Ukraine's second city, Kharkiv, what could be a trial run for the capital. Killing a health official said more than 20 civilians across the city since yesterday. Ukraine's President Zelensky accused Russia of using brutality against civilians to force him to sign a deal with Moscow, likely for his exit. And the international community is protesting those tactics. 100 diplomats walking out of a speech by Russia's foreign minister at the UN Human Rights Council on Tuesday. As a 40-mile Russian convoy is heading toward Kiev. But its progress is stalled, U.S. officials say, because of a lack of fuel and food. Russian forces are still expected to encircle and attack the capital after Ukrainians said Russia bombed a key television tower and a Holocaust memorial site. In Kiev, we went to Ukraine's biggest hospital for mothers and babies. The cold storage area downstairs, now a ward for fragile patients. Katerina's two daughters, Diana and Sophia, were born at five months. They were in an oxygen chamber together when the Russians started bombing. We had to rush down here as we were hearing the sirens and explosions, she says. Look at this place. It's old and rusty, and we don't know how long we'll be here. What about your family? Have you been able to see the rest of your family, or are you just here by yourself? I have a brother who helped me, but he's a soldier and has been activated, so I have nobody else. Oksana's daughter, Nicole, was born with complex needs and requires constant care. How's Nicole? We were giving her a blood transfusion every two weeks, but now her condition is getting worse and she feels worse, Oksana says. How are you feeling? I, I, I have a child myself who has special needs and has extra health issues, and I know how, how powerless you can feel to be a parent with a, with a sick child. It is very hard, she says. We want this war to stop because our kids suffer and we cannot go home. And as that convoy slowly makes its way toward this city, Kiev's mayor told residents to stock up on supplies and get ready to defend their city. And for the first time since this conflict broke out, Ukrainian troops announced that they went today on the offensive. All right, Richard, thank you so much. Let's bring in Colonel Mark Hansian, senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. G good morning to you. You just heard Richard's report from Kyiv. What do you make of the Russian advances so far, including these attacks on places where civilians live? Well, we're entering the second phase of the offensive. In the first phase, uh, the Russians uh, counted on the Ukrainians collapsing. Uh, the Russians uh, started this shock and awe campaign, you know, with uh, missile attacks and air attacks on airfields and headquarters. And then they invaded along three axes, along the north towards Kyiv, in the northeast uh, towards Kharkiv, and in the south out of uh, Crimea. 
And they sent um, armored columns ahead to try to capture cities before Ukrainian defenses could be established. Those columns were um, pushed back and defeated. Now the Russians are doubling down on their invasion. They're bringing up additional forces, as, as we've seen. And unfortunately, this second phase is likely to be very violent. Russian doctrine calls for the massive application of firepower. We're seeing that in Kharkiv now. And I think in this second phase, as the Russians launch a series of offenses, we're going to see a lot more of that and, unfortunately, a lot of civilian casualties. Colonel, let's talk about the international response. <laughs> President Biden announced last night the U.S. is banning Russian planes from U.S. airspace, just the latest move to try and isolate Russia. What more would you like to see the U.S. and allies do? And what will be the clues you're looking for to see if, if these actions are having any impact at all? Well, the international community is already doing a lot. You know, the sanctions have been uh, uh, very severe. The economic isolation of, of Russia uh, is increasing. And you're seeing a lot of secondary uh, effects. Institutions uh, around the world taking their own actions, you know, sports organizations, for example, excluding uh, the Russians and doing more of that, increasing Russian isolation so that the ordinary Russian citizen feels it, I think would be a, a very good step. And this happening. Um, we're doing uh, uh, weapons transfers. You know, we're sending uh, supplies. It's possible to increase those. There's been some talk about maybe sending aircrafts, Soviet air aircraft that the Ukrainians could use uh, immediately. There was some back and forth on that. Uh, with NATO, uh, a, an embargo of uh, oil and nat natural gas seems to be off the table because the Europeans are so dependent on uh, Russian oil and natural gas. One idea that's floating around that I, I think would be very dangerous is, is a no-fly zone. Um, it sounds benign, uh, but what we saw in Iraq when the United States imposed that is that uh, that would entail war with the with Russia. We'd have to send hundreds of aircraft over to. Um, attack Russian aircraft and airfields. We'd have to suppress their air defenses. It would be war with Russia. And I don't think there's any um, support for that among the, the public. And certainly we're not ready for that. Colonel, while I have you, I want to talk to you about the support we're seeing from especially Europe and the West really uniting <coughs> behind Ukrainians, levying these severe san sanctions on Russia. What does this mean for alliances like NATO, what we've seen over the last few days and weeks? This uh, crisis has revitalized NATO. You know, just a couple of years ago, the United States was struggling to get NATO to increase its spending and to take the threat in the East more seriously. Um, the alliance has been very united. Uh, even members who were thought maybe to be a little iffy, uh, like Hungary, have, have come along with um, diplomatic actions. And the Germans have done a um, complete reversal. You know, a month ago, they were essentially appeasing Putin. Uh, now, They've shut down the Nord Stream 2, they, and they've pledged to increase their defense spending, which had been very low, and the German military forces had been um, you know, really uh, in a very uh, bad way. Um, so I think going forward, you know, you're going to see NATO uh, uh, increasing its spending uh, and taking more aggressive actions. All right. Colonel Mark Hansen, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Now to the growing refugee crisis in Central Europe. The United Nations estimates more than 660,000 people have fled Ukraine in the past week, including countless families with children. NBC News senior national correspondent Tom Yamas has been speaking with some of those families, watching very emotional goodbyes. And he joins us now from Lviv in western Ukraine. Hi, Tom. Good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. You know, we've been covering this almost a week now, and I've seen no sign of it, this slowing down, this refugee crisis. Just behind me, these are some of the Ukrainians trying to get out of here. They've been waiting for hours, they tell me, hoping to get on a train to Poland. The sad reality is, is that a lot of the trains today are leaving to border towns. Still in Ukraine, though, Romania, Poland, Hungary. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get out, but at least you'll get closer. And for all of these people, especially all these families, they're willing to take that risk. This morning, the flood of Ukrainian refugees showing no sign of slowing. Young and old facing harsh winter conditions as they flee the violence in their country. All these kids, it's quite cold now. It's like um, zero degrees. It's not like summer. If families do make it out, this is where some of them come. A makeshift refugee camp across the border in Poland. Many here unsure of what to do or where to go to next. Those who remain in Ukraine preparing for battle. 
Volunteers weaving camouflage nets to protect vehicles and servicemen from Russian drones and planes. Long lines of civilians forming at gun shops to purchase weapons. Just days ago, 19-year-old Vitaly was at the university in Kyiv. So are you scared of the, of the Russians? No, I'm not scared because uh, we know what we fight for. We Ukrainians, uh, we fight for justice and for freedom and for liberty. And Russians, they do not know what they fight for. 30-year-old Victoria Zamborina has just left her home in the country's capital. Why did you come out here? Why are you in Lviv? Because it was so horrible to stay in Kyiv. It was really uh, scary. They were bombing us. And I was, I didn't belong to myself. I was going crazy. And every hour, more tearful scenes like this. Families being separated, facing uncertain futures. It's terrible because, because it's, it, it was so unexpected. And nobody was prepared to, 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 to this situation. And we believe that... We will see them soon. So the UN has a new estimate out. They think about 4 million Ukrainians will try to escape this country. Having covered this now for a little bit, I would not be surprised if that number still is much higher. Behind me, you can see all the children of Ukraine who are trying to get out. So many families here. Every day we come out here, we hope to see these lines thinning out, but the crowds are still the same size. People still so desperate, so sad, so ready to get out of this country, at least while the, this war is still going on. Joe and Savannah, back to you guys. So many children whose fathers also had to turn back to fight. Tom, thank you so much. In his State of the Union address last night, President Biden balanced global and domestic policy, criticizing Russia's decision to invade Ukraine while looking to ease Americans' concerns over the economy and the pandemic. NBC News Chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander has a recap. Good morning. This really was a tale of two speeches last night. First, the state of the world, or more specifically, the state of Ukraine, stacked on top of a much more traditional State of the Union address. President Biden slamming Vladimir Putin's war, arguing the Russian president is now more isolated from the world than ever, and that the U.S. and its allies are inflicting pain on Mos Moscow before looking to revive his stalled agenda back here at home. Entering a chamber filled with yellow and blue, the colors of the Ukrainian flag, President Biden forcefully condemning Vladimir Putin. He has no idea what's coming. Denouncing the Russian invasion as premeditated, totally unprovoked, and a mistake of historic proportions. He badly miscalculated. He thought he could roll into Ukraine and the world would roll over. Instead, he met with a wall of strength he never anticipated or imagined. He met the Ukrainian people. Ukraine's ambassador to the U.S. receiving a standing ovation and an embrace from First Lady Jill Biden. While the president emphasized U.S. troops would not fight in Ukraine, he delivered this emphatic warning to Russia. The United States and our allies will defend every inch of territory that is NATO territory with the full force of our collective power. Every single inch. With Russia already facing crippling economic sanctions, the president announcing a new penalty to further isolate Moscow, barring all Russian flights from U.S. airspace. The president also suggesting America is finally emerging from the pandemic. Stop looking at COVID as a partisan dividing line. See it for what it is, a god-awful disease. And despite a fast-growing economy, President Biden acknowledging too many people are still feeling the pain of rising prices. Inflation is robbing them of gains they thought otherwise they would be able to feel. I get it. In one surprising moment of unity, the president tried to move his party to the middle with a message on crime that even got some Republicans on their feet. The answer is not to defund the police. It's to fund the police. Throughout his speech, the president was repeatedly heckled by a pair of far-right Republicans, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, including what he invoked the memory of his late son. I know. One of those, one of those soldiers was my son, Major Bo Biden. Boebert yelling 13 of them, an apparent reference to the number of service members killed during the U.S.'s chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan. The president's speech immediately panned by Iowa's Governor Kim Reynolds, who gave the Republican response. It's time to lead. But we can't project strength abroad if we're weak at home. In the end, President Biden praising Americans' resilience and resolve. The State of the Union is strong because you, the American people, 
are strong. With COVID cases declining, the president also detailed the next phase of his pandemic response, including a new test to treat initiative designed to provide patients with new antiviral medications just as soon as they learn that they are infected. Still on Ukraine, the key issue in this moment of global uncertainty, President Biden really looked to rally the world together in its fight against autocracy overseas, hoping he may also be able to unite Americans behind other priorities here at home. Back to you. Peter, thank you. Vice President Kamala Harris joined the Today Show this morning to discuss the United States' latest stance on the situation in Ukraine. Here is some of that conversation. Do you still believe these actions that the U.S. and the West have taken will be enough to stop him? The United States has been a leader in bringing together our allies, our NATO alliance, the EU, to stand firm and resolute with some of the most severe sanctions and consequences that we've ever seen as a unified group. And what has the impact been? Well, the impact already we've seen. The ruble is in a freefall. What we've seen is the Russian stock market is closed. Um, what we've seen is that Russia has received a credit rating of basically junk. So we know it's having impact, um, but we also are acutely aware of the human tragedy of it all. These sanctions are having quite the effect on the regime, and yet the regime, Vladimir Putin, continues apace with some of these brutal attacks that are only getting worse by the day. So my question to you is, what more is the West and the U.S. prepared to do? Well, we are going to continue to do what we've done. For example, in the sanctions, it's been sanctions against their financial institutions, against their oligarchs, where we are targeting their mansions and their jets. Um, what we are going to continue to do is stand firm with our allies in terms of reassessing what we are doing with sanctions. Everything is on the table for consideration, frankly. What we are not going to do, and that must be said also, is as the president has continuously said, we are not going to put U.S troops in Ukraine to fight the Russians on the ground or in the air. But we are firm in our preparedness to defend our NATO alliance and our allies every inch of the NATO territory. And we will continue to do that. And finally, uh, one of the more disturbing developments in the last week is, is Putin rattling his nuclear sword, putting his Russian nuclear forces on special combat readiness. Have you seen Russia take any concrete action to back that up? The U.S. did not respond in kind. Do you not take that as a serious threat? Well, we, we listen to everything, obviously, but it is irresponsible to escalate, and we feel very strongly about this. Um, as you know, we have a history of working with Russia in terms of this issue, and, um, and we will move on in terms of making sure that there is not escalation around this. Frankly, I think it's, it's highly irresponsible. It's something we will obviously monitor, but our position is that we are not going to, to contribute to an escalation in that direction, and we have no intention of changing our posture. All right, that was Vice President Harris, of course, speaking to the Today Show's Savannah Guthrie. We're following the latest in Ukraine all morning, but there are some other major headlines we want to get to. Just ahead, we'll have the latest on Queen Elizabeth after her COVID diagnosis. And now on the mend, what we're learning from Buckingham Palace as she's getting back to work. Plus, the new normal. More than half of the nation's largest school districts have made masks optional. We'll tell you who experts say should keep their masks on. That's next. You're watching Morning News now. School districts across the country are dropping mask mandates for students as COVID cases steadily decline. It's part of a new normal the country is entering into, but doesn't mean the worst of the pandemic is behind us. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more. It's time for kids to ditch the masks and breathe a little easier in a growing number of schools nationwide. That's good because especially with my little girl, she doesn't like too much. It's time that we at least have our own choices. The new reality drawing a mixed response. I think it's a smart decision to keep it on. Because everyone feels a lot safer with it on. More than 50% of the largest districts have made masks optional. New York City could change its school policy next week, barring any unforeseen spike in cases. L.A. County on March 12th, making some parents there uneasy. I'm just not ready as a um, parent. I don't think that i um, completely gone yet because there's people still have COVID. California is also dropping its requirement for vaccinated people to wear masks in most indoor settings. Same for Washington, Oregon, and Illinois, just to name a few. 
A recent poll showed 50% of Americans support some kind of mandate, down slightly from 55% last summer. But in many forms of public transportation, the masks are still required and don't expect to fly without one. Federal officials tell us they're working closely with the CDC, but for now, the rules stand. In many of the places where the mandate has been lifted, officials still recommend some people wear masks. Who are the people at this point, even without a mandate, who should still be masking? So there are four groups of people. Number one, unvaccinated. Number two, those older than 65 who are unboosted. Number three, very immune compromised. And number four, the people who live with any of the folks in the first three groups. For those who are taking masks off, medical experts recommend not throwing them away. We are not in the clear from COVID. Not yet. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. Some hopeful news now. The United Kingdom and the whole world, really, are breathing a collective <laughs> sigh of relief after Queen Elizabeth resumed her duties this week. Yeah, NBC News' Kathy Park has the latest on this. The Queen welcoming two new ambassadors virtually, easing concerns that have been mounting for more than a week about her health. The Queen canceling several engagements after she tested positive for COVID on February 20th, experiencing mild cold-like symptoms. This after Prince Charles and Camilla tested positive days before. Prior to the Queen's diagnosis, she cracked jokes in her last face-to-face -face meeting with senior defense officials. Good morning, Your Majesty. How are you? Well, as you can see, I can't move. A major reception at Windsor Castle for foreign diplomats remains canceled, although Prince Charles out and about on Tuesday reportedly saying she's a lot better now. The Queen is alleged to have met with members of her family over the weekend at Frogmore Cottage, including William and Kate and their three children. The Duchess of Cambridge just back from a successful solo trip to Denmark. And as the Queen prepares to celebrate her Platinum Jubilee year, Kensington Palace is hosting an exhibition showing archive photographs of the royals as we've rarely seen them before. A young princess Elizabeth with her dog, precious moments with her father King George VI in his study. Queen Elizabeth, the queen photographer herself, showing images of the royals as a normal family, a tradition that continues to this day. Getty Royal photographer Chris Jackson capturing the celebration of Prince Charles's 70th birthday. It says unexpected moments that generally happen when you're, of course, least expecting it, which are the, are the best photos, and you always kind of know you have a feeling inside you. I mean, it's always great fun photographing the royal children. I have to find myself looking on the back of the camera and smiling because you've got these lovely pictures. The Duchess of Cambridge, well known for taking candid photos of her children, snapped this joyous picture of Prince George. And also featured in the exhibit, Princess Diana walking in a cleared minefield in Angola and Prince Harry following in his mother's footsteps. Plus, there's a powerful image of Diana holding the hand of an AIDS patient and a stunning glimpse of the princess snapped by a member of the public. Thanks to Kathy Park. That exhibition is a journey through history and comes during a year of celebration as the Queen prepares for that platinum jubilee. All right, this morning we're also watching the results from Texas, where voters cast their ballots in the first elections of the 2022 midterms. NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki has the latest results. And of course, he is at the big board. Steve, for a second last hour, I was in front of our big board with some political news behind me. And I think everybody was like, where is Steve? So thank goodness you're here. Tell us the latest. <laughs> well, here we go. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a cliffhanger. <clears throat> Pardon me. The biggest piece of outstanding business here in Texas is this house race in the 28th district. This is South Texas. Henry Cuellar, the incumbent, you see he leads right now as challenger, a progressive Jessica Cisneros, by two points. The key is you got to hit 50 percent in these Texas primaries to avoid a runoff. So at the moment, Cuellar is below 50 percent. However, there are some question marks about some potential outstanding vote here in the district, particularly right along the border here you see in Starr County. Starr County is, as you can see, a Cuellar stronghold. So we're trying to track down. The, these are the numbers that we got from the county. The county announced mm -hmm. late last night. There are some questions here about whether this is, in fact, everything from Starr County. And again, you can see do, how good Cuellar is doing here, how close he is to 50 right now. Additionally, provisional ballots. There are still some mail ballots yet to be counted in this thing. So there are some other ballots that will come in and be tabulated today and beyond. So it, for the moment, 
Cuellar is under 50, and if this were to hold anything like this, you'd have Cuellar, Cisneros. They would then have a runoff on May 24th. These two candidates would run. Uh, we would lose the third candidate. But again, let's see, because there's been a, lo a lot of confusion, particularly, as I say, around Starr County there in South Texas. And the other interesting development here, I think potentially significant development in these primaries, again, mm -hmm. a congressional primary, North Texas, 3rd District, Van Taylor, a Republican, you see he is going to finish under 50 percent. He is going to be forced into a runoff. Van Taylor voted for that independent January 6th commission. He earned the ire of a lot of pro-Trump folks in his district. That was the basis of these challenges he faced in the primary. Keith Self, it looks like, is going to face Taylor in the runoff. It's a question here for Taylor. It's a big margin he still leads by, but do the dynamics change in a runoff now? Would Donald Trump himself get interested? Would he judge Taylor to be weak? Would national pro-Trump groups, national pro-Trump media get interested, make this runoff an event? Things could get dicey for Taylor if something like that were to happen. He was hoping to be above 50 to avoid a scenario like this. So that's the other major development in the House side to come out of last night. Steve Kornacki, so much to watch for there. Thank you for watching through. And we hope you're okay with your voice. Thank yeah, you so much sorry. for powering too, too much through talking. that. We've, we've broken Steve. Yeah, no. I know. And of course, on a, of course, on a primary results day, Steve, thank you thank so you. much. Thanks, Steve. Now, many people across the country watched the State of the Union last night. Voters in one key state are paying close attention to what the president had to say. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas joins us this morning again from Reno. Guad, good morning. So the president hit on a number of topics last night. Let's start with Ukraine. What are voters telling you about what they heard about that in the speech? Joe, good morning. Well, we've been focusing a lot on these uh, nonpartisan voters, the undecided voters here in Washoe County, which is the swing county in Nevada. So coming into the State of the Union, I should say a lot of them kept bringing up the situation in Ukraine, and they wanted to hear the president talk about what America will be doing as a leader. And also they wanted to hear the sanctions that would be coming against Russia. So a lot of them are behind uh, President Biden's announcement. Uh, let's hear from one of these voters. I understand it's the State of the, the Union. You just kind of hit these topics yeah. and we go. But I'd like to see more clear-cut answers of how we're going to actually achieve some of these, some of these things. Now, we're going to fight inflation, but we also are going to push through all these bills, and we need a lot more spending and spending and spending and spending. So I, I don't understand that, and I would like to understand how that's possible. Uh, so we heard from the voters. Now, that was them speaking about domestic issues. We also did speak about uh, the response to the Ukraine crisis. A lot of them, they said they were behind President Biden when it came to the announcements that the, they're going to have more sanctions against Russia, right? But then we got into the domestic issues, and uh, this is what they responded. What we just saw, we just played that too soon. Uh, but essentially, what voters are telling us is that when it came to these domestic issues, inflation, the price of gas, the price of housing, and other things that have been affecting them uh, before the Ukraine crisis was the first uh, thought at mind for everyone, they don't really see the Biden administration offering a clear uh, plan that really uh, makes them feel like President Biden is going to help things change for them here uh, domestically, Joe. All right, so Guad, after all that, after talking about Ukraine and domestic issues, did the speech have any impact on how the people you spoke with are going to vote in the midterms? Right. So every time we have these conversations with the undecided, the nonpartisan voters, you tell, you know, you ask him about the Biden, the Biden administration. A lot of them saying they haven't seen uh, what they wish they would have, what the promises the Biden administration made, uh, the Biden administration hasn't delivered. Uh, but they're not completely disappointed. Uh, and when you ask him about the alternative, the first thing they say is there is no alternative on the Republican side. Many of them telling me that uh, the Republican options that they have are just not any that they've considered. So for the most part, although they say they are unhappy with the current administration, they still have faith in uh, President Biden. Joe. All right, Guad, thank you so much. We have more of our coverage of Russia's invasion in Ukraine in just a few minutes. Coming up, President Zelensky's wife and two children are still believed to be in the country. We're going to have a closer look at Ukraine's first lady and her message during the crisis. Plus, Africans are among the hundreds of thousands of people fleeing Ukraine, and they say they're facing racist treatment as they try to cross the border. A look at what they're facing and reaction from officials next. 
Russia's invasion of Ukraine is causing tremendous levels of human suffering and loss. It's also causing pain for people who identify as both Russian and Ukrainian. And it's tearing apart families with relatives in both countries right now. Many are fearing the worst as the intense fighting continues inside Ukraine's major cities. Alona Cherkovsky grew up with a Russian mother and a Ukrainian father and now lives in London. University of Mary Washington professor Dan Hubbard has relatives living in both countries at this moment. Good morning. Good morning to both of you. Thank you for being with us today. I know this can't be easy to talk about, so we're grateful that you're helping us understand some of the more nuanced aspects of this. Alona, I'll start with you. And I know that you split time between Moscow and Odessa, which is actually where the Russian Navy came in during this invasion. Can you put into words what it's like to see this conflict unfold in a place you and your family spent so much time in and where you still have family in both countries? To say the least, this is devastating. And I think it's devastating to people who share this kind of mixed Ukrainian and Russian heritage like myself. Um, because we grew up like this, there are tens of millions of people in that region who share sort of my destiny, my history, my DNA. Mm. Um, Russians and Ukrainians have lived so closely together. They share families, they share faith, they share, you know, <laughs> what used to be a common geography. Um, and. Uh, the situation is beyond devastating to um, our friends, our relatives who still remain in Ukraine. Yeah. And uh, we are trying to parse out how to make sense out of any of this and what the end game really is. Mm. Professor Hubbard, let me bring you in here. And I actually want to read something that you told the New York Times that is just one of the more heartbreaking things I've heard here. You said, I have cousins on both sides and I dread them killing each other. Uh, what has this been like for you, trying to get in contact with them? Have you been able to? Uh, tell us about the concern for their well-being and, and what this is like, having them on either side. Alona said it so eloquently, um, devastating, absolutely devastating. Um, one of my Russian cousins has been arrested in the protests. We don't know the conditions he's being held under. Uh, my Ukrainian family lives just outside of uh, Kharkiv, and... Um, just devastating, absolutely devastating. All this because of a, a sociopath. And Alona said it said it perfectly. We, we share DNA. Mm. Kiev, Kiev is the birthplace of Russian culture. And for this man to to bomb our mother, to kill our people, um, it's it's an abomination. Abomination is the word. Mm. Professor Hubbard, you also said that you feel for both sides because Russian boys don't even know why they are there. I think that's such a nuanced point that really gets at some of the more complicated aspects of this, like the misinformation and the differences between what citizens of each country are being told. What did you mean when you said that, that they don't know why they're there? Putin is a Kagi Besnik. Uh, in English, you would say KGB man. And, uh, you know, kill, grab, brutalize. And they are masters, masters of disinformation. And many of the young conscripts were absolutely, totally lied to, convinced that they were there to liberate Ukraine from these so-called Nazis. Uh, that, that is a, a devilish lie. And they are genuinely shocked at, at the uh, reception they're receiving. They're stunned. They, they, you know, why are we being greeted as an occupying? Why are people fighting us when we're here to liberate them? And um, mm. my only hope in this is the mothers of Russia. Um, the mothers of Russia can stop this. Mm -hmm. Alona, as I mentioned, your mom's from Russia, your dad's from Ukraine. Explain to our viewers how common dual heritage is among people from this region, that it's, that it's just not so black and white, simply put. And what do you want people watching right now to know about how connected the two countries are to each other and what this specific pain is for those who do feel that they belong on both sides? You know, I was joking with my family the other day that there's so few Russians without the Ukrainian heritage and there's so few Ukrainians mm. without Russian heritage. We're yeah. so interlinked. I mean, what, what springs to mind is, you know, 20 years ago, a war in Yugoslavia where, you know, Serbs and Croatians and Slovenians stood up against one another. I mean, people have lived together for thousands of years. I mean, orthodoxy is over 1,000 years old. Orthodoxy started in Kiev. Um, obviously, Ukraine was annexed into the USSR in, um, in 1917, 1918. 
But um, make no mistake, these are two distinct identities. These are two distinct countries with sovereign rights recognized under international law. What is happening is a brutal occupation and attempted annexation that, as, um, the, as Dr. Hubbard is saying, is completely devastating and not to mention illegal. Mm -hmm. um, we lived together for so long that we didn't have to reconcile these identities. They comfortably coexisted within ourselves because, you know, Ukraine is a massive melting pot of people who come from Romania and Moldova and Greece and the huge Jewish community there as well, of which I'm a part of. Um, we never had to question this before mm. the events mm. of a few years ago, really, because we coexisted and lived together comfortably. After 1991, obviously, Ukraine declared its own sovereignty and became a different country, which, for people like me, asked us to take sides, which... Mm having grown up with both is complicated to do because of course <laughs> it's not complicated to do because obviously it's, it's clear what side we're on but right. the devastating thing is we have to take sides mm. Alona Cherkovsky and Professor Daniel Hubbard thank you both so much an enlightening conversation and I know a very personal one for both of you so we appreciate you sharing and we're thinking about both of your families thank you thank so you. much with each passing day, more attention is focused on Ukraine's president, along with his family, specifically the first lady, who, much like her husband, is taking to social media to publicly speak out against the invasion. NBC News correspondent Kelly Kobieya joins us now from Poland near the border with Ukraine with more on that. Kelly, good morning. Joe, good morning to you. The First Lady's location is unknown at this hour, but she's believed to be with her two children in Ukraine. And uh, she, her, her ability to stay there, her decision to stay in country uh, and support her husband has drawn admiration from people around the world. Long the dutiful partner to President Volodymyr Zelensky, Olena Zelenska is now emerging on a world stage in her own spotlight, a voice of hope and resilience for Ukraine and its people, as her own family faces an increasingly grave threat to their lives. Zelenska taking to social media this week, sharing a message of resolve at the start of the Russian invasion. I have no panic or tears in me. I will be calm and confident. The 44-year-old mother of two admits she's always been more comfortable in the background. Telling Vogue Ukraine in 2019, she was concerned when her husband decided to run for president. I was not too happy when I realized that those were the plans. I realized how everything would change and what difficulties we would have to face. But since entering office, Zelenska has focused her work on several key issues, including women's rights. The first lady highlighting the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian women who have stayed behind to fight on the front lines. I once wrote that women in Ukraine are two million more than men. Now it takes on a whole new meaning. My admiration and bows to you, my incredible compatriots. Also an advocate for children's development, Zelenska drawing special attention to Ukrainian infants born in bomb shelters, proclaiming one day the newborns will live in a peaceful country who defended herself. While her husband gained fame in front of the camera, Zelenska worked behind the scenes as a comedy writer and screenwriter. Both were born and raised in the same city in southeast Ukraine, but didn't meet until they were university students. On Valentine's Day, the couple sharing this video, telling the world, let's love each other and let's love Ukraine. President Zelensky has said that according to Ukraine government information, he is Russia's target number one. His family is target number two. It is impossible to overstate the great personal risk this first family is taking by staying in Ukraine. Joe, Savannah. All right. Kelly, thank you so much for that report. Now more than 600,000 people have fled Ukraine as Russia advances further into the country. But some refugees from Africa who've left Ukraine say they faced racist treatment, segregation and delays before being allowed into neighboring European Union countries. NBC News correspondent Zinclay Esamal joins us now with more on this. I'm so happy that we are covering it. Zinclay, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you, Savannah and Joe. That's right. Disturbing video is circulating online under the hashtag Africans in Ukraine as Africans and other non-white refugees say they are 
are facing unjust treatment at Ukraine's borders. Africans in Ukraine allege racism and discrimination at the country's borders. Video posted this week by a Nigerian student studying in Ukraine and verified by NBC appears to show military officials pointing guns at refugees who say they are not being allowed out of the war-stricken country. According to video, officials continued to point the guns even as refugees raised their hands in surrender. We've been here for three days. We died in Alexander Somto Ora, a Nigerian student, was there. He alleges officials at multiple borders turned refugees of color away. Ask them, do you identify the criminal fighters on them? Because I don't see you checking passports. I see you picking for white people early. How would you describe what's happening at the border? I don't like using the word racism, but it's racism. And I was expecting people that are in war to be more compassionate. These statements echo to our teams in Poland on the border with Ukraine. They spoke with one man, a Senegalese student, who asked to conceal his face. You had all the documents to cross. Was it that help even, make it faster or is it slow no, no matter what? It does not even get, help you to get faster. As Russia invades Ukraine, hundreds of thousands have been displaced and traveled miles by car and on foot, looking for a way to safely exit Ukraine. More distressing video verified by NBC shows footage of Ukrainian forces seemingly denying a black person entry on a train. Many refugees sharing similar accounts of being stranded online. The Ukrainians were, were let in. And the, and the foreigners, they were segregated to one side. They were treated differently. Ukraine's foreign minister tweeted Tuesday night that, quote, Africans seeking evacuation are our friends and need to have equal opportunities to return to their home country safely. The African Union released a statement on Monday saying, quote, reports that Africans are singled out for unacceptable dissimilar treatment would be shockingly racist and breach international law. On Monday, the permanent representative of Poland to the United Nations said that allegations of discrimination were, quote, a complete lie. For Aura, days after failed attempts to cross, he says he and other Africans stormed past the border, then were granted legal entry. What do you want people to know about the experience of Africans in Ukraine right now? I want people to know that the exact people asking the world for help is committing a war crime against Africans. And Savannah and Joe, it's important to point out that that African student I spoke with really emphasized that Ukrainian citizens have been welcoming and warm, offering mm. food and shelter. But he says at the border is when he's been met with resistance. Of course, officials and the countries have denied these allegations, but it's something we're going to continue following closely. Please do such important reporting. Sinclair Esama, thank you so much. Thank you. And after the break, reaction to President Biden's State of the Union address. Coming up, we'll tell you what black voters thought of his speech next. Welcome back. There's plenty of reaction this morning to President Biden's State of the Union address. This morning, we're hearing from a key group of voters who helped him win the White House back in 2020. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins us now from Atlanta. So Blaine, good morning. I know you spoke with a group of black voters just this morning. What did they have to say about what they heard last night? You know, Joe, they said overall they were satisfied with the tone of the speech. They said that they liked that it was a unifying message. They enjoyed hearing that from the president and drew a contrast to the previous administration. But when it comes to substance, they say they were listening for very specific things along voting rights, about child care, about policing. And they say that they wish they had heard more substance on that front. Take a look. Voting rights. I cannot emphasize enough that we did not hear that. That was one minute. I remember timing it and just hearing, oh, you've checked that box mm -hmm. and now you've moved on. He touched on, I mean, I have two sons. So, I mean, police reform is, is very important to me. It's important. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing about teenagers that literally don't want to get their driver's license or drive um, out of fear. 
and you know, both of them did sort of give the caveat of, listen, they understand that he has a lot to cover, a lot of ground to cover uh, in, in a defined amount of time. But they did say that, especially when it comes to voting rights, the first lady that you heard from is a voting rights activist. She's somebody who spent a lot of time in the run-up to the 2020 election registering voters, knocking on doors, making sure that people got out to the polls. She says those are the very people who put President Biden in office. And she says that voting rights, again, a sticking point that we've heard before, is something that she really wanted to hear more of, guys. Blaine, what else stands out from your conversation with these voters? I know you just spoke with them. Yeah, you know, I also talked with Sashida McNair. She's somebody who was a mother. We actually first met her back during the primaries in 2020. She was sitting out in the rain, holding her then infant son, and they'd been waiting for several hours. So we followed her. We talked to her a lot, uh, you know, since that time. And I asked her, you know what, was the time in the rain worth it? She said, absolutely. But there's something that she wanted to hear as well. Take a look. As far as, like, <laughs> the job, I'm, I'm a little disappointed because I felt like people have like increased their prices on childcare, making it inaccessible mm. to those who have multiple kids. And you know, my sister just passed, so I just adopted my nephew here. And now I find that people are like overpricing. You heard her there. She has her two little boys with her today, and she said childcare. That's something that she really wanted to hear about. In addition to that, uh, student loan forgiveness is something else that she really wanted to bring to the forefront. So overall, again, they were satisfied with the tone. You know, two of them said that they would rate it about an eight, but they say, again, when it comes to the midterms, when it comes to energizing voters, that it's very important that they hear the things that they believe are most important to them, the things that the president campaigned on and effectively got him into office. They say that they want to make sure that those things remain a priority, guys. Blaine, quickly, I know it's early, but any chance the speech influences how they're going to vote in the midterms? You know, I actually asked that. I said, you know, do you think it's going to go one way or the other? They said not necessarily. They're still going to be fired up. They're still going to be excited when it comes to going out and getting voters and, and making sure people turn out to the polls. But they say, again, there needs to be that return on investment, specifically the activists that I spoke to said there needs to be that return on investment to make sure uh, that the momentum still keeps going for the midterms. Still a ways to go before those midterms. Blaine Alexander, thank you so much. Appreciate that this morning. Coming up, New York City is home to the largest population of Ukrainians in the United States. We'll take you to a restaurant in New York's Ukrainian neighborhood next, where people are lining up to support the business. Thousands of miles from Ukraine in New York City, you'll find a family-owned restaurant with deep ties to the region. Veselka, long known for its pierogies and family atmosphere, is seeing, seeing a surge of support with customers lining up around the block. I spoke to the owner about how emotional the last week has been for his staff and what this restaurant represents in a time of crisis. I have a, I have a young guy that works for me that's lost four of what, his, what he considers his brothers, guys that he grew up with or fight, that were on the front line. Inside the Manhattan restaurant, Veselka, the crisis in Ukraine is close to home. I would say a good third to 40 percent of my uh, uh, employee base is Ukrainian and have, that has direct ties to Ukraine. Um, they're very concerned. They have siblings and fathers and uh, that are fighting. Owner Jason Burchard says the last week has been a whirlwind for his family's business, with New Yorkers arriving in masses to show their support. Business has pretty much doubled in the last week since the invasion. I, I think a lot of you, the, the Ukrainian community patrons that are coming are, are very uh, happy to see that we're here and we're open. So you are Ukrainian? Mm -hmm. You were born there? Yeah, born there. Where? In Khmernitsky. What's it going to mean today when you go in there and order and support this business? Support. Showing them my love. Yeah. And I hope that we all get through this together. Inside the East Village staple, many employees are anxiously waiting to hear from loved ones in Ukraine. And I know you've been offering them paid time off. One of my servers, a, a Ukrainian, uh, has uh, direct links. Her parents are in Kiev, and she just wanted to be by the phone all, day, all week this week, so she requested a week off, and uh, I will uh, supplement her income for this week. Others find the work a welcome distraction and a chance to be together. They don't want to be stuck to the internet or the TV and seeing, you know, the, the tragedy which is, which is unfolding. I think in working in unity, they know that, they're, that we're standing, they're, they're standing together. Some have even considered leaving New York and joining the fight in Ukraine. I've had several male employees ask me, you know, what, you know, what, what my thoughts are. Of course, I would support them. What's that like for you when one of them comes I, It makes me want to join them. They're calling up any able-bodied male 
in Ukraine from 18 to 60. I'm 55. I mean, I, I, if I were living in Ukraine, I would be asked to join the army. Customers say coming to Veselka humanizes the crisis. When they unfurled the Ukrainian flag last week, it really made this sort of abstract thing very, very real. And for Ukrainians in the States, it's a small piece of home when their country's future remains uncertain. Is your family scared? Yeah, on the daily they worry about, like, because like I saw everyone on my father's side is still over there. Because you never know, like, today it's Kiev, but tomorrow it could be the rest of Europe. In addition to supporting his employees, Jason is using his restaurant to support Ukrainians fighting overseas. Well, we're going to start collecting uh, uh, medical and uh, basic supplies that it will be that I will uh, pay for the shipping. We are partner with several nonprofits that I've worked with before. We're passing out QR codes so people can direct links to donate. And going forward, any of our uh, Ukrainian borscht, this is our homemade beet soup, all those sales will go to help uh, Ukrainian uh, relief efforts. I think the world is just moved by the resilience of Ukrainian people, making Molotov cocktails, showing up to fight. We're very proud, resilient people. We, we've been down this road before. Being 30 years sovereign this past year, anniversary, they're going to die fighting. His message to Americans? This isn't just about Ukraine. But this is a war on the free world. We have to really think this is a war on all of us. And we, we need to really stand up and, and, and have our voices heard. It was a really quick flash in the piece there, but actually in the kitchen there were women who were making pierogies with their phone propped up to be continuing to watch the news events. Just so hard to separate the two, but finding community at least there. And incredible to hear that some are willing to go from New York to Ukraine to fight. That's just how important this is to them and how much their country matters to them. Absolutely. And he's a great boss in general. This stepped it up tenfold. I mean, saying he makes him want to do the same. And he's having people come into his office crying and just comforting them as they're waiting to hear from family. Love seeing all those long lines around the corner oh, there, which have so been much all support. over social media. Yeah, right. yeah. That does it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.